plots, schemes, sex, affairs, murders, and wars, all for the control of a throne. All of this sounds like the plot for Game of Thrones, right? Well, it all happened in real life as well, where primarily two families fought and divided England for control of the throne, the Yorks and the Lancasters. What was the cause of this great civil war? How complex and intricate were the political maneuverings? Did Henry VI actually cut off a dick and eat it during one of the battles? I'm going to answer all of those questions more in, on today's historical quarrel. Welcome back to Historical Quarrels. I'm your host, Tyler Eckhart, and I'm here with... Where am I? You're, you're with me. You said there'd be food. Shut the fuck up. You, you said there'd be food, and now I'm chained to a chair in front of a microphone, man. Um... <clears throat> Anyways, uh, uh, it's uh, Brayden. <laughs> He's definitely not chained up to a chair. Um, anyone calling the cops on me can uh, suck a dick because uh, he's going to be here for a while. <laughs> um, no, guys, uh, just want to say thank you um, for all the love and support. We've been growing uh, quite a bit, actually. We had uh, an increase of 30 downloads this last week. Not so, bad, bad. yeah, pretty good. And then we had um, a, not, not like a major increase in total of live plays, but it was around, uh, around like 20 more, which is really good still. It's growth, and growth is what's important. Exactly. The main announcement for this week is as, as you guys may have noticed, we've uh, upgraded the audio quality. It's, uh, it, it definitely sounds a lot better. So we finally got that done. Audio has been upgraded. So upgraded. Aww. Um, no, I'm I'm super stoked about it, guys. It's uh, I got the Sure uh, SM7. I love it. I think it's great. Not sponsored. Yeah, not not sponsored. I fucking wish. Uh, but I did get a good deal on it. So. You know, uh, if you guys want good deals on audio equipment, go down to Guitar Center. They have uh, about 50% off on a lot of objects. Also not sponsored. <laughs> Definitely not sponsored by Guitar Center. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, besides that, uh, we have, um, you know, from that growth, I'm assuming a lot of you are sharing with your family and friends, which is great. Please keep doing that. If you like the show, we... Parental advisory warning. Yeah, share specifically with anyone under the age of 12. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, please don't. That That's bad. Um, I mean, if they listen to it and you're okay with that, sure. I, I don't give a fuck. But um, if you don't want your 12-year-olds to listen to this, then, you know, don't let them listen to it. <laughs> that was not a call to action. Yeah, definitely not a call to action there. Uh, a little bit different today um, for our historical quarrel as we're going to be focusing on the families um, Lancaster and York. We're also going to be going a little more in depth into the people, uh, primarily Henry VI, uh, Richard of York, Queen Margaret of Anjou, Anjou uh, a.k.a. Cersei Lannister. She was the who George R. R. Martin based Cersei Lannister off of. So did she also never forget to repay her debts? She, oh no, actually no, she 100% pays her debts. Holy fuck, dude. She gets her, she gets hers. Um, but yeah, they, uh, and we're going to go over their kids as well. Uh, and then who ends up taking over for the quarrel before that though, we are going to go into a background of the house uh, that they both branches cadet from and why Richard of York and Henry both had semi equal claim to the throne. So, uh, oh yeah. Do you have any socials you want to announce spray for people to follow? Yeah, I stream every Thursday night from 5.55 to 6.02 on Chatterbait. Uh, because of certain things, it is never the same username, and it is uh, never the same thumbnail. 
So if you want to find me, you'll find me. That's all I can say. He has lots of tattoos and his dick is curved to the left a little. To the right, actually. Oh, to the right. Sorry. I look at it from a different angle. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, let's uh, let's go ahead and get into this. <clears throat> let's start this lesson by meeting the family who our quarrelers are descended from. House Planta Plantagenet or Plantaget was a royal house that originated from the lands of Anjou in France. The family held the English throne from 1154 with the the ascension of Henry II at the end of the anarchy to 1485 when Richard III died in battle. Under the uh, uh, Plantagets, England was transformed. The Plantagets were kings were often forced in uh, to negotiate compromises such as the Magna Carta. Which one? uh, The first one. And I think the second one, which had served to constrain the royal power in return for for financial and military support. The king was no longer considered an absolute monarch in the nation, holding the prerogatives of judgment, feudal tribute and warfare, but now also had defined duties to the kingdom uh, underpinned by a sophisticated justice justice system. A distinct national identity was shaped by the conflict with the French, Scots, Welsh, and Irish, as well as by the establishment of the English language as the primary language. So it sounds like at this current time, there's just a lot of reform. A lot of reform uh, during the the reign of the Plantagenets. Essentially, these guys were, they fucked up so bad that they lost the right to be a king that could do whatever the hell they wanted to do. To be fair, the Magna Carta didn't really prevent them from doing whatever they wanted, um, as they could just really still do it. They just had to take extra steps to do it. <laughs> so it just it made them go through a legal system to do whatever the fuck they wanted. Still, I hate going through the middleman whenever I want to do what I want to do, yeah. and then I have to go through like six different people. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah, if I was a if I was a king, and then they still made me go through that, I'd be pissed too. Yeah, it's a, it's a little annoying, and that's uh, essentially what happens uh, with with this family. In the 15th century, the Plantagets were defeated by defeated in the Hundred Years' War and beset with social, political, and economic problems. Popular revolts were commonplace, triggered by the denial of numerous freedoms. English nobles raised private armies, engaged in private feuds, and openly defied Henry VI. So I don't know if you share the same problem as me, but if I spend a lot of time doing something and I spend a lot of time like focusing, but the chance for failure is very high and very definite, the longer, uh, the longer I spent doing, trying to do something, if I fail at the end, yeah. Right? Like, if (laughs) you spend all that time trying to accomplish a goal and you fail, uh, that destroys you mentally. Now, imagine if you were fighting a war for a hundred years. A hundred years. And you fucking lose. The worst part is they almost... So, uh, it's, it's funny you say that. Henry V almost won. He was literally two years away from being the French and the English king after having conquered almost the entirety of Europe. And his son fucked it up. I, I thought blue balls were bad. But so like, bad, dude. I, I thought blue balls were bad, but at least when it happens to me, I don't lose... An entire kingdom. An entire kingdom. Uh, France. Potentially <laughs> battalions of men, all of my money... Most of your money. That's. Uh, I'll take. I'll take the uh, testicle pain. I'll take the nutsack pain. Any day of the fucking week. Um, yeah. So Richard of York, the third Duke of York, adopted Plantagenet as his family name in the 15th century. Plantagenet or Plantagenist had been a 12th century nickname for his ancestor Geoffrey, Count of Anjou and Duke of Normandy. One of many popular theories suggests the blossom of the common broom, a bright yellow gold flowering plant called the Genista in medieval Latin as the source of the nickname. There is a few other sources as well that we'll go over. So what you're telling me is that brooms grow on trees? Yeah. Why do they cost so much? I don't know. 
It explains why they suck, but why are they so expensive if I could just go out to a tree and prick a broom off of it whenever I was trying to clean something up? Are you willing to do it yourself? Carry on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty uncertain why Richard chose this specific name, although during the Wars of the Roses, 1455 to 1487, which we're going over today, emphasized Richard's status as Joffrey's uh, patrilineal descendant. The retrospective usage of the name for all of Joffrey's male line descendants uh, were was popular during the subsequent Tudor dynasty. Perhaps encouraged by further legitimacy it gave to Richard's great-grandson, Henry VIII, it was only in the late 17th century <clears throat> that it passed into common usage among historians. There are some other theories that Richard chose this nickname that say it was because he loved to insert row stems inside of his urethra and would yell out to God whilst doing it to cleanse himself of impure thoughts and eventually stopped the practice as it would end up having the opposite effect on himself. Wednesdays. Are you, am I right? Are you saying that you shove row stems up your ure- urethra on Wednesdays? I'm not saying that I don't. Oh, God. Okay. Um, um, anyways, I was fucking with people. So <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, no, he, he definitely didn't do. Well, I guess we can't, we don't know that he didn't do it. So. And and for sure we know that I I absolutely don't do that. No, no, I was fucking with them. Too. I was fucking with them too. Come on, guys. <laughs> um, but here's where we get into the. <laughs> I like to imagine that you just on Wednesday nights you're just screaming and your roommates just like, "What the fuck is happening in the bathroom?" <laughs> My roommate would not question it. You got a point there. He he really would. <laughs> so. We have the uh, Angevins, uh, the Angevins. Angevins is a French form from Anjou. The three Ang- Angevin kings, Angevin kings, were the 12th century Joffrey of Anjou's son, Henry II, and grandsons Richard I and John, uh, the king that toilets were named after because of how much shit he spewed. He was a big shit spewer. That's why it's called a port john Yeah. Uh, Angevin, uh, Angevin can also refer to the period of history in which they reigned. Many historians ident- identify the Angevins as a distinct English royal house. Uh, Angevin is also used in reference to any sovereign or government derived from Anjou. As a noun, it refers to any native of Anjou or an Angevin lead uh, ruler, and specifically to other counts and dukes of Anjou including the ancestors of the three kings who formed the English royal house, their cousins who held the crown of Jerusalem, and two unrelated members of the French royal family who were later granted titles and formed different dynasties, such as the Capetian House of Anjou and the Valois House of Anjou, where Marguerite's from. So the Queen Marguerite, Cersei Lannister's from. Consequently, there is a disagreement between those who consider John's son, Henry III, to be the first Plantagenet, uh, Plantagenet monarch, and those who do not distinguish between the Angevins and the Plantagenets, and therefore consider the first Plantagenet to be Henry II. Remember, they want to keep the Angevins and the Plantagenets separate. Just something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, th- actually quite a few historians who do try and separate them. It's I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's it's a little easier to break it up into like historical periods. However, in my opinion, there isn't really a difference. They're all kind of descended from the same line. So, so like, eh. the disputes would be like legitimacies of birth at that point. So. The later counts of Anjou, including the Plantagenets, were descended from Joffrey II, Count of Gatanais, and his wife, Ermengarde of Anjou. In 1060, the couple inherited the title via cognatic kinship from an Angevin uh, family that was descended from a noble named Ingliger, whose recorded history dates from 870. Pretty long, long ass time ago. <laughs> so, during the 10th and 11th centuries, power struggles occurred between rulers in northern and western France, including those of Anjou, Normandy, Brit- Brittany, Potoy, Blois, 
and Maine, and the kings of France. In early 12th century, Geoffrey of Anjou married Empress Matilda, King Henry I's only surviving legitimate child and heir to the English throne. As a result of this marriage, Geoffrey's son, Henry II, inherited the English throne, as well as Norman and Angevin titles, thus making the beginning of the Angevin and Plantagenet dynasties. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to think of something to say to kind of further the conversation with that paragraph. But the only thought that's in my mind right now is that Blois is is spelt like Blois. <laughs> and, and so now I'm... <laughs> You, you, you want somebody to blow us? Uh, no, I was thinking of like a weird French family guy skit. Oh. <laughs> where where Lois, it's just like... Like French Lois? Like blow us. <laughs> blow us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be, that'd be funny. Uh, man. It would make family guy watchable. Right? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the marriage was the third attempt of Joffrey's father, Folk V, Count of Anjou, to build a political alliance with Normandy. And we'll see later on that Normandy is basically impossible. You have to fucking conquer Normandy if you want it to work with you. <laughs> Hitler tried. Everyone fucking tries to conquer Normandy. <laughs> it's bad. Um, his first espoused daughter, Alice to William Ad- Adeline, Henry I's heir, after William drowned in the wreck of the white ship, Folk married another one of his daughters, uh, Sibli- Sibli- Siblia, to William Sito, son of Henry I's older brother, Robert Curthose. Henry I had the marriage annulled to avoid strengthening William's rival claim to Normandy. Because Henry I knew what the fuck he was doing. He was like, nope, can't have that shit go on. So, Finally, Folk achieved his goal through the marriage of Joffrey and Matilda. Folk then passed his titles to Joffrey and became king of Jerusalem. Again, there's so much political maneuvering <laughs> just in this first part. And this is what's going to lead us to the Hundred Years' War, is people just fucking with each other. I'm not even good at chess, so I, I, the fact that each piece could move in infinite number of ways is already kind of just going... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's um, essentially what they're doing. They're just kind of moving pieces around to guarantee that their bloodlines have some control of the throne. They don't really care about themselves having power. They care more like their prosperity gets it. Okay, so they have an incest meter, and their goal is to make enough progress in that meter so that way their families can always continue to progress that meter um yeah kind of it actually surprisingly not that much incest happening right now yet yet yeah well kind of i guess like they're cousins a lot of these people are cousins but like they're second cousins which according to dna apparently that's the perfect match Man, that scientist, that ain't me. That ain't me talking that shit. I, I'm just going to let that hang there. I'm just going to let that hang there. <laughs> All right, that's, that's fair. Um, okay. So, arrival in England. When Henry II was born in 1133, his grandfather, Henry I, was reportedly delighted, saying that the boy had then absolute biggest stones he had ever seen at that point and that he will plow all of europe with his seed which would make henry the first proud since he was he too was also a prolific layer of pipe in europe the allegory for myself is rather interesting when i was born my dad said the exact opposite tiny balls Tiny, tiny balls tiny balls this boy will never pipe how is he supposed to sow his seed? Hey, hey you prove him wrong. If hey, he has a it. single seed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, very. I've seen your baby pictures too. That's hey, you grew out of it. You know, it was it was a growing phase. That's that's all it was. That's okay. Now stay to your chain chair, okay? That's don't rattle the chains. Snacks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I need snacks. Give me the food. <laughs> you lied to me. <laughs> uh, the birth 
reduce the risk that the king's realm would pass to his son-in-law's family, which was possible of the marriage of Matilda and Joffrey and a childless. The birth of his second son, also named Joffrey, increased the likelihood of partable inheritance following French custom, in which Henry would receive the English maternal inheritance and Joffrey the Angevin paternal inheritance. This would separate the realms of England and Anjou, or France. In order to secure an orderly succession, Joffrey and Matilda sought more power from Henry I, but quarreled with him after the king refused to give them power that might be used against him. Which, you know, makes sense. Because why would anyone do that, even if it's your fucking kids? Like, why would I ever give my son an advantage over me when we play Super Smash Brothers? Just because he's two doesn't excuse how shitty he is at the game. Maybe if he wants to win, he should fucking get good and stop playing D-tier characters like Dr. Mario or Mewtwo and get on my level and get good with Solid Snake, Pikachu, or Fox McCloud. I put in the work. I deserve the W's. This is true. His son sucks. At Smash Bros. Uh, he used to try to play as Meta Knight against me, but I slapped him in the face, and he doesn't do that anymore. Little shit needs to understand his place, and will always be beneath me until he proves he's the superior gamer. <clears throat> MLG! I, I really do hope everyone knows that's a joke, and my two year old pl- only plays Mario Kart and Fighter Z and whoops my ass every time. So I try to play. Smash Bros with him, but he did try to pick Meta Knight, so I just turned the game off. I was not going to put up with that. Well, yeah, but the new Meta Knight's not OP. It's, you know. It doesn't matter. He was trying to win through psychological warfare by picking Meta Knight and giving me Vietnam War flashbacks about Brawl. (laughs) He knew what he was doing. Yeah, two-year-old. Actually... It, I am surprised by how good Everest is able to like pick up on some of those fighting games. Like it was, it was quick. Maybe it's because I play games so much. <laughs> that's why. But it's uh, it's crazy. You hear it here, folks. Tyler too busy playing video games to care for his son. Hey, he plays it with me, so you know that's. Yeah, you're right. I need to do better. <laughs> Uh, when Henry I died in December 1135, the couple were in Anjou, uh, allowing Matilda's cousin Stephen to, si- to seize the crown of England. Stephen's contested ascension initiated the widespread civil unrest later called the Anarchy, a topic we're going to go more, more in depth later in a different episode. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. The Anarchy. The Anarchy of King Steve. <laughs> really, though? King Stephen. Um, but then let's go ahead and get into the end and given Zenith of Henry's siblings. William and Joffrey died unmarried and childless. Um, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I don't actually, I, I, I have kids, so, you know, anyways, the rocky marriage of Henry and Eleanor, uh, who already had two daughters, Marie and Alix through the, her first marriage to King Louis produced eight children in 13 years. William the Ninth, Count of Poitiers, Henry the Young King, Matilda, Duch- Duchess of Saxony, who married a whole bunch of, fu- like, a fuck ton of people. Um, lot, she gets involved with a lot of shit. Richard the First, King of England, Joffrey the Second, Duke of Brittany, Eleanor, Queen of Castile, uh, who ends up marrying King Alfonso, and then John, Queen of Sicily, Count Raymond, uh, well, in, who marries... King William of Sicily, and then Count Raymond the Sixth of Toulouse. Jean, King of England as well, was also one of the kids. Henry <clears throat> also had illegitimate children with several mistresses, probably as many as 12. So that joke about him laying pipe earlier is fucking true. <laughs> like, he, was, he likes to lay pipe. These uh, children included Joffrey, William, Peter, and four children who died young by Alice, the daughter of Louise the seventh while she was betrothed to his son Richard. She literally went full, you know, that episode of game of Thrones where Joffrey like finds all the bastards of the Brathians and like has them fucking murdered. She pulls the same shit and like had them hunted down. It's crazy. Well, yeah. Cause in nature, when there is a new male lion that takes control of the pride, the first step is to slaughter all the children that would challenge him. Yeah. So it's nature. It's nature. We are just animals. Yeah, royals more so. They they were heartless fuckers. <laughs> so 
This is why the picture for the royalty is usually represented by a lion, because they will kill all the babies. Yeah, especially the Turks, man. Like the Turks and the Ottomans. Dude, when I get into that with the Rome and Carthage episode that I'm planning, it's going to be... They did some crazy shit with their kids. Leave a comment if you will be listening to that future episode. Engagement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talk, talk about, and then tell me what else, uh, what other quarrel, quarrel you'd like me to investigate further into and, you know, shit on, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> William's many competencies and importance as a royal bastard led to a long and illustrious career. So, r- remember again, Henry I, uh, proclamation, I'm just saying, he was right about his son, Henry II, had a whole bunch of kids, so. I will neither agree nor disagree. His opinions do not reflect my own. Yeah. (laughs) Henry reasserted and extended previous uh, suzerainites to secure possession of his inherited realm. In 1162, he attempted to reestablish what he saw as his authority over the English church by appointing his friend Thomas Becket as Archbishop of Canterbury. Upon the death of the incumbent Archbishop Theobald, Becket's defiance as archbishop alienated the king and his counselors. Henry and and Becket had repeated repeated disputes over issues such as church tenures, marriage of Henry's brother, taxation, whether or not whores were allowed, how much of the tip constituted anal sex, and if anal sex was wrong, why were the priests allowed to do it? You know, important stuff. Look, I don't know why they are trying to think of banning anal, okay? If God didn't want anal to be a thing, why did he make the happy button up in there? It, it, it's function over its form and function over substance. Got a point. You got a really good point there. <clears throat> and I agree with you. I agree with you. Definitely, definitely uh, important form and function for, for the ass. When was the last time you had your happy button pressed? It's been a long time. It's, it's been a really long time. Anyways, <laughs> Henry reacted by getting Beckett and other English bishops to recognize 16 ancient customs in writing for the first time in the constitutions of the Clarendon, governing relations between the king, his courts, and the church. When Beckett tried to leave the country without permission, Henry tried to ruin him by filing legal cases relating to Beckett's previous tenure as ch- chancellor. And it's super funny to me that even back then, all came down to was like courts and legal issues to try and fuck someone over completely. I also like how the king was basically going, hey, this guy, he's kind of a dick. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. That's all the proof I have. Arrest him. Do not allow him to flee the country. Yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, a lot of the legal cases were uh, to how he used church funds. But... Proven false, mostly. <laughs> like he, Beckett wasn't actually all that bad. The worst part is they used to be friends. Like Henry and Beckett used to be friends. So, um, just bitter differences in how to govern and rule. So, yeah. Uh, um, Beckett fled <clears throat> and remained in exile for five years. Relations later improved and Beckett returned, but they declined again <laughs> when Henry's son was crowned co regent by the Archbishop of York, which Beckett perceived as a challenge to his authority. He also hated the Archbishop of York for always teasing him with this plumptious, sweet, juicy ass that he just never got to tap. JK, uh, he just liked feeling important and in control, and that took away his in-control feeling, so. Yeah, but also, you could see, hey, I want to tap that ass, and then he just never gets to. And also, and also, the situation, right? It's like telling the people you live with, you will not, under any circumstances, paint this room pink, and then you just fuck off and move, and you're gone for five years, and you come back, and it's not even the same people anymore, and then you just look at them and go, why the fuck is the room painted pink? <laughs> yeah, just like right before you left, they or like right after you left, they painted it, and <laughs> it's just been there for a while. Um... But yeah, Beckett later uh, was uh, Beckett later excommunicated those who had offended him. When he received uh, this news, Henry said, 
What miserable drones and traitors have I nurtured and promoted in my household, who let their lord be treated with such shameful contempt by a lowborn clerk? He called his friend a fucking lowborn clerk. Like, <laughs> no, my office worker clerks must only be of the highest purebred highborns. I won't have any of this peasant nonsense. Yes, you can't be having peasant asshole with your dinner. You have to have royal asshole. <laughs> You have to have grade A5 asshole and Michelin star office. Yeah, so this one must be made. Mm. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it uh, reminds me of uh, the Game of Thrones episode where the church in King's Landing starts taking over and trying to fuck with the Lannister and Tyrell families. Uh, there's lots of parallels here to Game of Thrones. I'm not going to point out all of them, but a few that I see is remarkably similar because, I mean, that whole the whole like arc that Cersei had to go through uh, through season five and six, pretty wild with the church. So what you're saying is, is that when Game of Thrones was going in accordance to the books, which were a parallel, should you say, mm-hmm. of reality, yeah, that's when it was good? That is precisely what I'm saying. Yes. I fucking miss. I I wish that uh, George had written more so we could have had a, you know, a decent season seven. Seven had like two good episodes. One and a half. (laughs) And then eight was shit. I I thought D&D was like... So the director's D&D, I thought it was always like, oh, their names are this and this. I can't be bothered to remember their names. They both start with Ds. There's only so many names you can think of that start with a D. It's like, we're going to name our directing duo D&D because we're huge nerds and we're going to follow the script. And then they did the most un-nerdy thing that a dork would do and they deviated. Well, I I mean, part of it was because they just wanted to hurry up and get to you know, Old Republic, and use all the EU lore. D, d, uh, aren't Old Republic, isn't that Star Wars? Yeah, they are they're trying to get to do the Star Wars stuff, and then, because they fucked up Season 8 so bad, they don't get to. All, all I'm saying is, if they were true nerds... They wouldn't have done that. They would have waited. Oh, yeah. As long as it takes... And then George R. R. Martin will die. And then Branderson, Brandon Sanderson will come <laughs> write the entire <laughs> book in the span of a week. And that's all you have to wait for. True. So true. He would. <laughs> Man, that guy. How fast did he finish um, the the Wheel of Time? That was, it was quick, right? It was like a year, <laughs> if that. No, it's literally because Brandon Sanderson will look at a thing he he likes, and then he basically writes fan fiction for the thing that he likes, and he has all of these ideas and go, hey, I'm a fan of this. I'm not in charge of this, but if I was... And then all of a sudden people give him the property, and he's like, well... Uh, it's done. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> he's like, it's done. It's been done for five years. Holy shit. Right? Mark my words. Mark my words. The next From Software game comes out, and it's Brandon Sanderson Dark Souls. Uh, that game, it's already done. It is already done. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, anyways, after after that all went down, four of Henry Henry's knights killed Beckett in <laughs> Canterbury Cathedral after Beckett resisted a failed arrest attempt. Henry was widely considered complicit in Beckett's death uh, throughout Christian Europe. This made Henry a pariah. In penance, he walked barefoot into Canterbury Cathedral, where he was severely whipped by monks, which... I bet Henry was more than happy to let happen to him since he didn't have to deal with fucking Beckett anymore. Also, he may have been getting, you know, may have been into getting whipped. It does feel pretty good sometimes. We do different things on Wednesdays. You like the whip. I do enjoy the whip. What I enjoy on Wednesdays will remain unstated and up in the air. 
Lots of things shoved in the urethra. Anyways, <laughs> from 1155, Henry claimed that Pope Adrian IV had given him authorization to reform the Irish church by assuming control of Ireland. But Professor Ann Duggan's research indicates that the Laudabilter is a falsification of an existing letter, and that was not, in fact, Adrian's intention at all. It originally allowed Henry's brother William some, ter- some territory. Henry did not personally act on this until 1171, by which time William was already dead. So he essentially just lied, was like, hey, this is, uh, <laughs> this, this is what the archbishop said I could do, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> and then no one fucking questioned him until hundreds, almost a, <laughs> almost a thousand years later. Hey, um, hey, church. Yeah, I know technically I'm not supposed to do this legally, morally, theo- uh, theologically, but uh, hey, um, God just spoke to me. Yeah, he, God totally spoke to me, and uh, he says it's cool. He says it's cool. He says, usually this is the rule, but you, my dude... I'm going to make an exception for you, boy. 100%. That's what Henry VIII does to justify a lot of his shit, actually. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, would not be. Well, he's probably like one of the first kings to kind of try and do that, but he definitely won't be the last. Uh, Henry ends up invading Ireland to assert his authority over knights who had accrued uh, autonomous power after they recruited soldiers in England and Wales and colonized I- Ireland with his permission. Henry, Henry later gave Ireland to his youngest son, John, in 1172, Henry gave John Castiles of Chinon, Loudon, and Meribru as a wedding gift. This angered Henry's 18-year-old son, Henry the Young King, who believed these were his. You thought you had a good Christmas coming up? Oh, what did you get your kid? A Nerf gun? A doll? A pony? You ain't shit. Henry gave his son countries. You are bad parents <laughs> if you cannot give your child a country to do with as, you as please. they please. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well, actually, we'll 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 get into this. A rebellion by Henry the Second's wife and three eldest sons ensued. Louis the Seventh of France supported the rebellion. William the Lion, King of Scots, and others joined the revolt. After 18 months, Henry subdued the re- rebels. Again, this is Henry asserting his fucking dominance over his children. Henry fucking gets it. In order to cool the weak of your bloodline, you fuck them over and provoke them to war with you. So when you are done, the last of the kids remaining are the strongest and the worst, most war-minded. He 100% learned that from his dad. Uh, Henry... Definitely plays Warhammer 40k, and he absolutely plays his empire. <laughs> Crusader Kings, <laughs> where you have to like keep killing your kids and like siring new kids to make sure you get the best one. We need to make more monarchs. My current monarchs aren't the good monarchs. <laughs> I need to mid max my fucking kids. <laughs> I don't understand. I just want the strongest kids, but the grind is so long and tedious, and I just have to keep doing it because RNG is not on my side. Dude, it never is, man. Those poor kids, there are so many sacrificed. (laughs) So many. (laughs) They should have rolled better, dude. What do you expect? (laughs) Good point, good point. Uh, In Le Mans, in 1182, Henry II gathered his children to plan a partable inheritance. His eldest surviving son, Henry, would inherit England, Normandy, and Anjou. Richard, his mother's favorite, would inherit the Duchy of Aquitaine. Joffrey would inherit Brittany, and John would inherit Ireland. This resulted in further conflict. The younger Henry rebelled again, but died of dysentery. Or so they say. Other sources say that Henry II had him fucking poisoned with bits of peasant shit that was put into Henry the Younger's meals. Either way, he died of shit. Yeah, this this was a test to see if he had the stomach to rule a kingdom, which he obviously didn't since he died like a little bitch boy who couldn't, couldn't eat shit. This would all, also eventually lead to the phrase, eat shit and die. Interesting. Yeah. Joffrey died in 1186 after an accident in a tournament where he was fucking trampled to death. 
poor bastard. <laughs> in 1189, Richard and Philip II of France reasserted their various claims, exploiting the aging Henry's failing health. Henry was forced to accept humiliating peace terms, including naming Richard his sole heir. The old king died two days later, defeated and miserable. Which, so fucking sad. He kicked ass, and then right at the end, he gets fucked over by his kids. I relate. The king's death is how I begin my mourning. God damn. <laughs> it's too real, man. <laughs> French and English contemporary moralists viewed this fate as retribution for the murder of Becket. Even his favorite legitimate son, John, had rebelled. Although the constantly loyal illegitimate son, Joffrey, remained with Henry until the end, which is just so sad. Joffrey fucking loved him and stayed with him till the end. And every one of his kids beside him tried to betray him. And Joffrey just gets shit on at the end because <laughs> he's a bastard. Are, are you telling me the bastard does his best and it's never enough and he will never get the love that the legitimate kids will receive? Yeah. I relate. God damn. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Following Richard's coronation, he quickly put the kingdom's affairs in order and departed on a crusade for the Middle East. Opinion of Richard has fluctuated. He was respected for his military leadership and courtly manners. He rejected and humiliated the sister of the king of France. He deposed the king of Cyprus and later sold the fucking island. <laughs> He's such a bastard. Richard the first kind of fucking sucks. Not going to lie. Um, yeah, he on the third cruise on his third fucking crusade, he made an enemy of Leopold, the fifth Duke of Austria by showing disrespect to his banners as well as refusing to share the spoils of war. No, 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 Richard. You have to finish your second crusade before you can have your thirds. No, he he's like, no, it's mine. I get to have both. I get to have two crusades at once. Because he's French. <laughs> so. Jeez, Richard, why does your mom let you have two crusades? Uh, it's because he was the favorite. So, you know. And when you're the favorite, you get to do whatever the fuck you want. I never got to have two crusades. Same. He was r rumored to have arranged the, the assassination of Conrad of Montefrat. Less rumored and more of historians know he did it. Uh, there just aren't any documents directly stating that he did order it that we can find right now. But he fucking did it, essentially, is what most of them have said. <laughs> well, when you do a crime, just don't leave a paper trail. You'd be amazed how easy it is to get away with something when nothing is written down. Also, good point. His ruthlessness was demonstrated by his massacre of 2,600 prisoners in Anchor. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I totally didn't kill that one guy. But uh, yeah, those, those 2,600 people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah. I did that. It's called Escalation. <laughs> Richard did not give a fuck, man. He obtained victories during the Third Crusade, but failed to capture Jerusalem. According to Stephen uh, Runciman, Richard was a bad son, a bad husband, and a bad king. Jonathan Riley Smith described him as vain, devious, and self-centered. In an alternate view, John Gillingham points out that for centuries, Richard was considered a model king. But the model is made out of poo-poo. But it is an Excellent model of poo poo. Yes, an excellent model of shit. Uh, which I assume the reason for that is everyone feared this man. He executed 2,600 prisoners on a fucking whim. I wouldn't want to know what he'd do to me if he found out I talk shit and wrote negative shit about him either. I'm like, or any of his family members that loved him. Could you imagine the torture you would get? <laughs> so, well, we're all going to hell anyway, so maybe you'll get a chance to tell him that to his face. Got a point there. Returning from the crusade with a small band of followers, Richard was captured by Leopold and was passed to Emperor Henry the Sixth. A different Henry than the Henry Sixth we're going to be talking about. Obviously, uh, that our Henry the Sixth isn't going to be there till you know three hundred years later. So, our Henry the Sixth is better than their Henry the Sixth. Actually, Emperor Henry the Sixth was pretty good. Uh, Richard fucking sucked. 
Uh, this is an emperor, though. So Henry ha- held Richard captive for 18 months, 1192 to 1194, while his mother raised the ransom valued at, valued at 100,000 marks. In Richard's absence, Philip II overran large portions of Normandy, and John acquired control of Richard's English lands. After returning to England, Richard forgave John and reestablished his authority in England. <laughs> so essentially, John seizes control, and then Richard comes back, and John's like too afraid to try and face his brother because I'm pretty sure Richard would have fucking tortured him. <laughs> I was about to say, like, we talk shit about the guy and then he just forgives. Forgives and forgets. It's a lesson of morality. That guy did it. Why can't you? Actually, yeah, that is, <laughs> if Richard can forgive his brother for stealing, maybe we should all look at our brothers that we have issues with and, you know, try and forgive. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any, so do I need to forgive? Okay, well, that's fine. I'm your brother-in-law. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he left again in 11. Oh, God, that hurts, man. That's cold. <laughs> Richard leaves again in 1194 and battled Philip for five years, attempting to regain the land seized during his captivity. When close to complete victory, he was injured by an arrow arrow during a siege and died 10 days later. Fucking took an arrow to the knee to end his reign. I was just about to say, do we know where the arrow hit him? Do we know where the arrow hit him? I think the joke is possibly from King Richard, so (laughs) it may have been in the knee and it got infected or something and killed him. So what you're telling me is he was an asshole in real life and then centuries later he is the cause, potential cause for a joke that has tormented my mind for the last 10 plus years. Correct. Decline in the loss of the Anjou. Richard's failure to provide an heir caused a succession crisis and conflict between supporters of the claim of his nephew, Arthur, and John. So, again, lots of civil war over these two fucking houses. Mm. Uh, this is, is going to be a very constant theme uh, between England and France and even between England and England later. So, uh, Guillaume des Roches uh, led the magnat- magnates of Anjou, Maine, and Turin, declaring for Arthur. Once again, Philip II of France attempted to disturb the Plantagenet territories on, on the e- European mainland by supporting his vassal Arthur's claim to the English crown. John won a significant victory while preventing Arthur's forces from capturing his mother, seizing the entire rebel leadership at the Battle of Midebo, and his sister, Eleanor, fair maid of Brittany. So she was, she was hot. And people were like, yeah, that's hot. Oh, doth that be the fair maid of Brittany? The Brittany maid. Yes, yes. Fair is she. Fair is she, and her beauty is far known and world-renowned. It doth be Britney. It doth be Britney. Bitch. Bitch. Britney, bitch. Uh, John disregarded his allies' opinions on the fate of the prisoners, many of, uh, many of them their neighbors and kinsmen. Instead, he kept his prisoners so vilely and in such evil distress that it seemed shameful and ugly to all those who were with him who, and who saw this cruelty. According to the Histoire Guillemet de Marquel, as a result of John's behavior, the powerful Thors, Lusignan, uh, and Des Roches families rebelled, and John lost control of Anjou, Maine, Torin, and northern Poitou. Just, just a side note, I'm looking at your notes right now. Yeah. If I didn't know French was just like that, I would think you have the worst spelling on this planet. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, French is weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Um, his son, King Henry III, maintained claim to the Ang- uh, Angevin territories until December 1259, when he formally surrendered them, and a return was granted Gascony as Duke of Aquitaine and a vassal of the King of France. So, essentially, John was a dick, and he kind of, you know, was almost like another Richard, and uh, very torturous and cruel, and vile, but this time John gets called out for his shit and Richard doesn't. So, you know. You can't hide under daddy's protection and privilege forever, kids. 100% no. 
<clears throat> John's reputation was further damaged by the rumor described in Margam Annals that while drunk, he himself had murdered Arthur. And if not true, it is almost certain John ordered the killing. <laughs> he killed his brother well, like while drunk and just fucking... I mean, like, who does that? Like, it's got a point there. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think I don't have a brother? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> <clears throat> there are two contrasting schools of thought explaining the sudden collapse of John's position. Sir James Holt suggests that this was an inevitable result of superior French resources, which I doubt, because at the time, the French were losing a lot of their territories. John Gillingham identifies diplomatic and military mismanagement and points out that Richard managed to hold the ungiven territory with comparable finances. See France during World War II compared to France during World War I. <laughs> Good point. Nick uh, Bharat has calculated the ungiven resources available for use in the war were 22% less than those of Philip putting the Angevins at a disadvantage. By 1214, John had reestablished his authority in England and planned what Gillingham has called a grand strategy to recapture Normandy and Anjou. The plan was that John would draw the French from Perry, while another armor, army under his nephew Otto IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, and his half-brother William attacked from the north. He also brought his niece Eleanor of Brittany, uh, aiming to establish her as Duchess of Brittany. The plan failed when John's allies were defeated at the Battle of Bovines. Otto retreated and was soon overthrown. William was captured by the French, and John agreed to a five-year truce. So they just fucking sucked. I don't think the French just had, like, superior resources. They just fucking sucked. Yeah, sounds about right. And also, I feel like there's a lesson to be learned here. Um, when planning fun things that you could do with your niece, like let's say if you're babysitting or something like that, maybe consider the zoo instead of a battlefield. Just a thought. Just a thought. I'm no expert. I agree. I agree. The, that that would be uh, <laughs> probably a lot better. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, from then on, John also gave up the claim to Brittany of Eleanor and had her confined for life. John's defeat weakened his authority in England and his barons forced him to agree to the Magna Carta. So this is what leads us to the Magna Carta, the first one, which limited royal power. Both sides failed to abide by ter the terms of the Magna Carta, leading to the first barons war in which rebellious barons invited Prince Louis, the husband of Blanche, Henry II's granddaughter, to invade England. Louis did so, but in October 1216, before the conflict was conclusively ended, John died. Um, the official website of the British monarchy presents John's death as the end of the Angevin dynasty and the beginning of the Plantagenet dynasty. So the official British website, but again, it's, it's all part of the Plantagenet dynasty. So in my opinion and many other historians opinions. So, so what you're saying is your opinion reflects that of historians? A few, quite a few actually. Weren't the historians the one who wanted to segregate the families? There were a couple that wanted to as well, yeah. So there's many historians that agree and disagree. You said a majority of them agree. Yeah. There are a few that disagree, though. He wants his families to be segregated as God intended. Yeah, between the French and the English, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, let's keep the most let's keep the most annoying countries in the world segregated. I'm actually okay with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so the the main line, so the Bar uh, baronial conflict and the establishment of Parliament. All subsequent <coughs> English monarchs were descendants of the Angevin line via John, who had five legit legitimate children with Isabella, Henry the Third, Richard, King of the Romans in the Holy Roman Empire. Joan, Queen Consort of Alexander the Second of Scotland, Isabella, wife of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick the Second. Eleanor, wife of William Marshall's son, also named William, and later on, later the English rebel, Simon de Montefort. John also had illegitimate children with several mistresses. <laughs> Again, <laughs> this family line, lots of, lots of fucking. <laughs> they just love sex. There, there are lots of weeds in the family tree. So many, so many extra branches that, you know, weren't intended. These children probably included nine sons called Richard, Oliver, Henry, Osbert, Gifford, Joffrey, John Fitzjohn, or 
Kersey, Otto or Yudits, Fitzroy, Ivo, Henry, Richard, the constable of Willingford Castle, and three daughters called Joan. Matilda, the abbess of Barking and Isabella La Blanche. Joan was best known of these since she married Prince Lewin the Great of Wales. Mm. Yeah, so she she was just cooler than all the other daughters and, you know, married some other cool dude. Uh, that's that's all why she's the best known. Cool mom plus cool dad. Equals cool history. <laughs> William Marshall, first Earl of Pembroke, was appointed regent for the nine-year-old King Henry on King John's death. Thereafter, support for Louis declined, and he renounced his claims in the Treaty of Lambeth after Marshall's victories at the Battle of Lincoln and Sandwich in 1217. The Marshall regime issued an amended Magna Carta as a basis for future government. So this is the amendment now. Part two of four. Yeah. (laughs) Essentially... (laughs) Uh, honestly, it's like part two out of like 16. <laughs> so the Magna Carta is like a cockroach. No matter what you do, there will always be more. Yeah. Always. Always. No matter how hard you try to stamp them out. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Despite the Treaty of Lambeth, hostilities continued in Henry's force to compromise with the newly crowned Louis VIII uh, of the France and Henry's stepfather, Hugh X of Lusignan, the, they both overran much of Henry's remaining continental lands, further eroding the Angevin's power on the continent. In his political struggles, Henry perceived many similarities between himself and England's patron saint, Edward the Confessor. Consequently, he named his first son Edward and built the existing magnificent shrine for the Confessor. I think he just wanted to suck the Confessor's dick, to be honest. <laughs> my, my comment was... Uh... You think it would be someone with the office or nickname of Confessor that would unironically tell you to sound a roast bush? Yeah. <laughs> In early 1250... What? I'm sorry. Can you explain? I'm oh. confused. Okay. All right. So this is going to be a mini lesson with Brayden as we teach Tyler about the concept of urethral sounding. What sounding is, is when a man. Or wait, wait, wait. Is that what you're talking about? Like with the rose bush? So you were talking about the urethral insertion? Yeah. Okay, go on. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, he takes a lubed or unlubed stick, or in this scenario, a legged thorn bush that is neither here nor there and inserts it into his urethra and moves it up and down until completion. That has been a mini fetish lesson with Brayden. <clears throat> in early 1255, <laughs> holy fuck, man. Okay. Yeah, in early 1255, a great council approved a tax of 40,000 pounds to dispatch an army, which quickly retook Gascony. During an assembly, uh, feudal prerogatives of the king were challenged by the barons, bishops, and mag- uh, ma- magnates, magnates, who demanded that the king reissue Magna Carta and the charter of the forest in exchange for support. Magna Carta 3. This time it'll work. We promise. <laughs> doesn't. Henry declared the charters were issued of his own spontaneous and free will and confirmed them with the royal seal, giving the new charter and the charter of the forest of 1255, 1225 much more authority than any previous versions. All I'm going to say is if the law of the land was called the charter of the forest, I would trust it than if it was called the Magna Carta. Yeah, it's it gets so much worse, to be honest. You hear charter of forest and you're thinking of like woodland elves, like gnomes, fucking deer running around like a waterfall. Yeah, but for like a system of government? I would not say no to a system of government <laughs> run by hippies tripping on acid. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Um... 
All I'm saying is they have a lot of ideas, and sometimes a small number of those ideas are actually good. That's fair. That, you know, that, that's fair. I, I like to think that him saying that it was given of his own and spontaneous free will is like, you know, when somebody has a gun to your head and they're like, suck my fucking dick. And then you get down on your knees and you suck the dick and you get, you know, you're doing it and you, you get done and you're like, oh, yeah, no, I totally did that because I liked it. Uh, please don't kill me. <laughs> so. Or for a current example to date the year of this podcast, the CEO and owner of Hobby Lobby giving his, giving his entire business away because he said God told him to. And this is totally not related to the fact that his company lost millions after going on an extremely homophobic rant. Anyways, Henry the Third and I God damn. Way, way to bring it in, Bray. <laughs> yeah. The, the way that you help people retain information through lessons is by giving them something that they can relate to or observe. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, Henry III definitely is relatable with uh, Hobby Lobby CEO <laughs> doing some homophobic shit, man. Um, and laying pipe across the land. Yeah, him and Henry II and Henry the First. They all, oh, and John. Um, but he, he had nine children. Edward I, uh, Myra Grants of England, Beatrice, Countess of Richmond, Edmund Crouchback, who was granted the titles of states of Simon de Montfort in the Second Baron's War. Um, anyways, four others who died as children, Richard, John, William, Catherine, and Henry. Henry was bankrupted by his military expenditure and the general extravagance. The Pope offered Henry's brother Richard the Kingdom of Sicily, but the military cost of displacing the incumbent Emperor Frederick was prohibitive. Matthew Paddy wrote that Richard stated, You might as well say, I make you a present of the moon. Step up to the sky and take it down. <laughs> and basically, like, yeah, yeah, here you go. I'm going to give you all this. And then, uh, you know, but you, you're going to have to be one to fucking do all the work to get it. Yeah, it's like when you're looking at like Facebook Marketplace or Classifieds or something, it's like, it's totally free, but you have to haul all of it away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you have all the added costs of like gathering everything. It's it's crazy <laughs> what he did. Or a company saying, hey, here's this nifty little self-checkout machine. You know you want to use it. You don't like talking to people. Add responsibility and chances of failure in exchange for not igniting your social anxiety. It's snowing. I'm out, Fuji. <laughs> that was a haiku. Uh, instead. No, it wasn't. Uh, it totally was a haiku. I I ended it properly. It's no wing on Mount Fuji. Yeah, it's haiku. Oh yeah, that's a haiku. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so instead of uh, Henry, you know, going ahead and trying to take that, he he purchased the kingdom for his son Edmund, which angered many powerful bar barons. The barons, led by Henry's brother-in-law Simon de Montfort, forced him to agree to the provisions of Oxford, under which his debts were paid in exchange for substantial reforms. In France, with the Treaty of Paris, Henry formally surrendered his the territory of the his Angevin ancestors to Louis the Ninth of France, receiving in return the title Duke of Aquitaine and territory of Gascony as a vassal of the French king. So a lot of a lot of trading uh, of lands at this point, which is going to cause a lot of territorial disputes. <laughs> Again, which will lead us into the War of the Roses because no one knows who the fuck owns what. Are you telling me the the Treaty of Paris immediately prefaced uh, territory disputes? Yeah. Weird how that happened like multiple times throughout history, huh? Even modern history. <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. Uh, disagreements between the barons and the kings intensified. The barons under Simon de Montfort, 6th Earl of Leicester, captured most of southeast England in the Second Baron's War at the Battle of Lewis. <laughs> Louis, or no, Le Lewis, uh, I can't pronounce. 
L E W E S for everyone that wants to know what that is in 1264. Hey France, this is what happens when you make a language out of an alphabet of 14 letters. People who were not born with the language will continually piss you off trying to pronounce it. Yeah, but to be fair, English is kind of stupid too. <laughs> so I never said that it wasn't. That's fair. Um, I prefer Spanish to be honest. Spanish makes fucking sense. Like it's, it, it just makes more sense than like most other languages in my opinion. My favorite language is caveman language. If you cannot confer your point with grunts, screams, and growls, maybe you you don't have a point. Maybe you don't have a point. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't think I could fully convey that. So uh, I probably don't have points. Uh, so you just disregard the rest of this podcast. Uh, anything I say doesn't, you know, no point. <laughs> I will be taking over the podcast. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, Brayden has asserted his dominance uh, uh, using Neanderthal speak, so I have to uh, go ahead and resign. I, this is the last episode. Uh, I'll be the host. <laughs> um, anyways, Henry and Prince Edward were defeated and taken prisoner. De Montfort assembled the great parliament, recognized as the first parliament because it was the first time the cities and boroughs had sent representatives. Edward escaped, raised an army, defeated and killed Montfort at the Battle of Evesham in 1265. So, you know, Edward gets the job done finally. Savage retribution was inflicted <coughs> upon the rebels and authority restored to Henry. With the realm now peaceful, Edward left England to join Louis the Ninth and on the Ninth Crusade. The fucking Ninth. There were so many crusades. He was one of the last crusaders. Louis died before Edward's arrival, but Edward decided to continue. The result was disappointing. Edward's small force only enabled him to capture Acre and launch a handful of raids. After surviving an assassination attempt, Edward left for Sicily later in the year, never to participate in a crusade again. When Henry III died, Edward uh, ascended, ascended to the throne. The Baron swore allegiance to him, even though he did not return for two years. So uh, everyone kind of respected Edward for fucking up uh, Simon de Montfort. And they're like, yeah, no, we're not going to try and start shit because he will finish it. It's like Florida. If you just create chaos in the most impressive way people aren't going to try to stop you because it's impressive and terrifying. Honestly, though, and this is where we get to the constitutional change and reform of feudalism. So we're going from feudalism um, and reforming it, making it more Magna Carta E, <laughs> more, more power to the parliament and to the rich people. So it's more of an oligarchy than feudal. So Edward I married Eleanor of Castile. Daughter of King Ferdinand of Castile, a great grandson of Henry II, through his second daughter, Eleanor, in 1254. Edward and Eleanor had 16 children. <laughs> Five daughters survived to adulthood, but only one son survived, Edward. And that son was named Edmund. A. <laughs> uh, yeah, Eleanor, Countess of Bar, three daughters, Joan, Alice, Juliana, Catherine, slash Catherine, and two sons, John and Henry. Uh, Joan, Countess of Gla uh, Gloucester, Alfonso, Earl of Chester, Margaret, Duchess of ba uh, Brabant, Mary of Woodstock, who became a nun, which is so funny <laughs> to me. <laughs> Woodstock, man. They, <laughs> she comes to nun. Isabella, uh, and then Elizabeth, firstly Countess of Holland, and on widowhood, secondly Countess of Hereford. Among her 11 children uh, are Hereford of Essex, Northampton, Ormond of Devon, Edward II, Two other daughters, Beatrice and Blanche, who died as children. That is what historians believe that they are named, but in reality, their children's names were Ed, Eddie, Edmund, Edward the second, and Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth. 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 Will, if you ever listen to this, love you. <laughs> we love you, man. Following Eleanor's death in 1290, uh, Edward married Margaret of France, daughter of Philip III. <coughs> 
of France in 1299. Edward and Margaret had two sons who both lived to adulthood and a daughter who died as a child. So, yeah. Lucky. Goddamn, yeah. All right. The, <laughs> another deal with our shit. <laughs> Thomas, uh, whose daughter Margaret inherited his estates. Edmund, Earl of Kent, the Black Prince. Or, uh, okay, so Edmund, loyalties ha- to his half brother Edward II resulted in his execution by the order of the rebel Mortimer and his lover. Edward's queen, Isabella, his daughter Joan, inherited his estates and married her own cousin, Edward the Black Prince. Together they had. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Richard, who <laughs> later became the English king. And then they had Eleanor, who lived from 1306 to 1311. Evidence for Edward's involvement in legal reform is hard to find, but his reign saw a major program of legal change. Much of the drive and determination is likely to have come from the king and his experience of the uh, baronial reform movement in the the late 1250s and the early (coughs) 1260s. With the statutes of Mortmain, Edward imposed his authority over the church. He was like, hey, church, suck my dick. And the church was like, oh, no, no, we don't want to suck your dick. But then Edward was like, no, you're going to fucking suck it. And then Edward was like, hey, there's this thing. It's called tithing. I give you money. You suck my pee-pee. And church is like, mm, yes, pee-pee. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, essentially, I give you money and um, you ignore everything I fucking do. <laughs> you don't talk to me. <laughs> so, Just like police. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> the statutes prohibited land donation to the church, asserted the rights of the crown at the expanse, expense of traditional feudal privileges, promoted the uniform administration of justice, raised income, and co- codified the legal system. His military campaigns left him in heavy debt, <coughs> and when Philip IV of France confiscated the Duchy of Gascony in 1294, Edward needed funds to wage war in France. More war in France. Always war in France. When Edward summoned a president-setting assembly in order to raise more taxes for military finance, he included lesser landowners and merchants. The resulting par- parliament included barons, clergy, knights, and burgesses for the first time. So those were, you know, they actually started getting more involved. Yes, but also remember this entire time that it's going on and they're talking about raising income... That's not for the peasants. The, there is an entire underclass of peasants who just kind of do what they do and work themselves to death. Yeah, they're not even really human. <laughs> they're, they're not even really treated as human. And they weren't, and that's why they're not included in this tale. Yes, and this is where we start expanding in Britain with the Plantagenets. Uh, on his ascension, Edward I sought to organize his realm, enforcing his claims to pr- uh, primacy in the British Isles. Then when uh, Gufford claimed to rule North Wales, entirely separate from <coughs> England, but Edward viewed him to be a rebel and dist- disturber of peace. He was a rebel and disturber of peace, and he, you know, just... Bothered everyone, caused me problems, and I fucking hated him, and I just, you know, just couldn't couldn't deal with him. Uh, and note this to my will, on my headstone, I want it to say "Rebel and Disturber of the Peace." Obviously, my body is not going to be buried there, but I would still like a headstone that says "A Rebel and Disturber of the Peace." If there are any uh, lawyers. That could add that to my will. Um, that'd be cool. <laughs> I wrote my will four years ago on a piece of a spiral lined notebook paper with a crayon. So I'm sure it won't be that hard to find. Really wouldn't. Um, Edward's determination, military experience, and skillful nail naval maneuvers ended what was to him rebellion the invasion was executed by one of the largest armies ever assembled by an english king comprising anglo-norman cavalry and welsh archers and laying the foundation for future victories in france leyland was driven into the mountains and later dying in battle so they fucking got him (laughs) he did the fucking job the statue of rudan um, rudlan established england's authority over wales the statue of Rodan is completely different, and that one is cooler because it has two swords and a tiny horse. You a tiny horse that he liked taking care of. I love that game. <laughs> he learned magic so that way he could stay with his horse. So 
adorable. Like seriously, that was like the sweetest thing they've ever written in a Dark Souls type game. Like, uh, and you still murder him. Well, I mean, it's a, like a mercy killing, you know, because he's gone fucking insane. Would you want to live like that? Um, uh, the the lawyer who's adding the graveyard thing to my will. If I ever obtain one of these uh, mental mental debilitating diseases that are frequent among old age, of which there are many, uh, just take me out. Just take me out. Do it. Um. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Uh, Wow. Uh, okay. Anyways, Edward Stone was proclaimed. That was a call to action. All right. Uh, Edward Stone was proclaimed the first English Prince of Wales upon his birth. Edward spent vast sums on his two Welsh campaigns with a large portion of it spent on a network of castles. Edward asserted that the King of Scotland owed him feudal allegiance and intended to unite the two nations by marrying his son Edward to Margaret, the sole heir of King Alexander III. When Margaret died in 1290, the competition for the Scottish crown ensued by invitation of Scottish magnet, uh, magnates. Edward I resolved the dispute, ruling in favor of John Balliol, who duly swore loyalty to him and became king. Edward insisted that he was Scotland's sovereign and possessed the right to hear appeals against Balliol's judgments, undermining Balliol's authority. Balliol allied with France in 1295. Edward invaded Scotland the following year, deposing and exiling Balliol. Edward was less successful in Gascony, which was overrun by the French. With his resources depleting, Edward was forced to reconfirm the charters, including Magna Carta. <laughs> Again, <laughs> so many times. That was his grunt to, you know assert dominance again to obtain the necessary funds in 1303 the french king restored gascony to edward by signing the treaty of paris another treaty meanwhile william wallace rose in balliol's name and recovered most of scotland and thus had the biggest dick in all of the land yes wallace was defeated at the battle of falkirk after which robert the bruce rebelled and was crowned king of scotland Edward died while traveling to Scotland for another campaign. King Edward II's coronation's uh, coronation oath on his succession in 1307 was the first to reflect the king's responsibility to maintain the laws that the community shall have chosen. Auto is lu in French. I said that so wrong. I already know. And, and anybody that speaks French, I am not sorry. <laughs> so he was not unpopular initially, but faced three challenges: discontent over the financing of wars, his household spending. And the role of his favorite, Piers Gaveston, when Parliament uh, decided that Gaveston should be exiled, the king was left with no choice but to comply. Edward engineered Gaveston's return, but was forced to, uh, to agree to the appointment of ordainers, led by his cousin, Thomas II, Earl of Lancaster. So we have the Lancasters and Yorks working in the background now to reform the royal household with Piers Gaveston exiled again. When Gaveston returned to, to again to England, he was abducted and executed after a mock trial. So, despite him getting him back there, they still fucking kill him. The same thing happens in all mock trials, to be honest. I had a kid in high school who I had to watch uh, face the firing squad. Goddamn. God, really? You don't remember that? It was you. Oh, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> it's okay. He got better. I did. I did get better. Uh, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> okay. Uh, the ramifications of this drove Thomas and his adherents from power. God damn it, Brayden. <laughs> <laughs> Edward's humiliating defeat by Bruce at the Battle of uh, Bannockburn, confirming Bruce's position as an independent king of Scots, leading to Lancaster being appointed head of the king's council. Edward finally re- repealed the ordinances after defeating and executing Lancaster at the Battle of Borough Bridge in 1322. So Lancaster's kind of in the shit show right here, but then they get back up to power and then they lose the power. The French monarchy (laughs) asserted its rights to encroach on Edward's legal rights in Gascony, 
Resistance to one judgment in St. Sardos resulted in Charles IV declaring the duchy forfeit. Charles' sister, Queen Isabella, was sent to negotiate and agreed a treaty that required Edward to pay homage to, in France to Charles. Edward resigned Aquitaine and Ponthieu to his son Edward, who traveled to France to give homage. <clears throat> oh, I lost track of where I was. Uh, thank you. Uh, with the English heir in her power, Isabella refused to return to England unless Edward II dismissed his favorites. And she became the mistress of Roger Mortimer. So she 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 fucked around. She was she was having some fun. You know, Roger Mortimer, that that's not gonna be someone who is going to be unsuccessful. That's a successful name. Very successful. The couple invaded England and with Henry III, Earl of Lancaster, captured the king. Edward II abdicated on condition that his son would inherit the throne rather than Mortimer. Although there is no historical record of the cause of his death, he is probably believed to have been murdered at uh, Berkeley Castle by having a red-hot poker thrust into his bowels. Thursday nights. Holy fuck, man. <laughs> I cannot imagine a worse torture, to be honest. Uh, no, that's a lie. I can imagine quite a few worse tortures. That, But again, a red-hot poker poked into like your stomach and then like stirred around, essentially, is what what is what's said to have been done. Uh, honestly, I thought you were making another joke. No, that's what happened. Oh. I actually, I, I have only told like a couple jokes this. I, every time someone has died, I, there was a part of me that goes, is he joking right now? <laughs> Holy fuck. Yeah. No, no. Truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. And in regards to what you said about not being able to imagine, I watched the Hellraiser movie when I was a very impressionable young boy, and hasn't it hasn't been the same since? Yeah, I, I, I get that. But yeah, no, uh, just imagine a red hot poker going inside you and fucking around with your insides. I, I want you to picture that for a moment, and just think about how fucked up that is to, to do to someone who surrendered and is giving you what you want. And he's just trying to make sure his son gets his shit. Will you please excuse me? I need to go to the bathroom for approximately 20 to 35 minutes. God damn, you're going to last a while there. <laughs> a coup by Edward III ended four years of control by Isabella and Mortimer. Mortimer was executed. Uh, though removed from power, Isabella was treated well and lived in luxury for the next 27 years. So even though she was definitely the main person being complicit in the murder of his dad, um, he was just like, no, fuck it. Just go away. I don't ever want to see you again. And she got, got away scot-free. Those who do not learn from the events of the past are doomed to repeat them. 100%. That brings us to the end of part one of, of this long, long tale of the War of the Roses and the history that led up to it. All right, that uh, brings us out of our lesson today. Um, how, what, what did you think? Like, what, what are your opinions so far in this whole ordeal? It feels like you were busy researching history, and then you went along on a tangent, and you made a AU fan fiction crossover of Warhammer 40k and Game of Thrones and just changed the names around when you realized I was on my way over <laughs> to save face and try to make it sound relatively uh, true. I wish I could tell you that's exactly what I did. I would feel impressed if that was my fan fiction, but that's... Mo so there are two bits in there. There's the bit with Henry the first saying his uh, son had huge balls and was going to lay pipe everywhere. And then the uh, bit with um, Beckett and Henry the second killing. Um, well, Beckett wanting to fuck the archbishop of York. That that was the other bit. But for the most part, the rest of it was all true. That's ju that's just history. So the parts that I would like, oh yeah, I could see a king saying that about his son's nuts 
or oh shit, <laughs> or, or some or like a priest wanting to touch a pee pee. The, the only two that I didn't question were the only two beds. Like yeah, the the main ones that I just kind of mis- did the purpose mislead. So I thought I under I thought I would be able to tell your sense of humor, but you know what? Got you got them. Got them. Thank you. I uh, I worked hard on that. So it's uh it's been, I don't know uh, what 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 are your thoughts so far between the relationships between like the the kings and their sons and how the land's getting divided. Essentially, this is turning into a confusing mess, which is definitely, definitely the purpose and why what happens happens. And so when when it inevitably goes to hell in a handbasket, with this amount of setup being required, you know it's going to be stupid. Yeah, so... Essentially, this, uh, this, and then the next, probably the, the next episode is going to be covering um, the Hundred Years' War and like the lead up to the War of the Roses. Because in order to understand why the Yorks and the Lancasters decide to like go at it, is mainly because Richard York is descended from this same line that Ed- Edward the Third is, and Edward the Third starts fucking around and like dividing up his kingdom during the Hundred Years' War with the French kings. So, so basically, if you give infinite amount of money to multiple people with generational trauma, yeah, it ends exactly how you'd think. Yeah. So, yeah. Next next week we're gonna go because we're at the end of uh, Edward the Second's reign. We're gonna get into Edward the Third, and Edward the Third's kind of like the main guy that people that the the House of the Lancaster and York branch off of. So. Does that mean? Does that mean we're finishing up? No, the conflict. There are sixteen battles for the War of the Roses. I'm not going to go over the all the battles for the Hundred Years' War. If we ever do like a full episode on the Hundred Years' War, then I will. But there are sixteen battles, and the shit that gets said between the the kings and like Richard during it is so funny. God damn it! I just wanted my snacks. Can you loosen up the chains at least? No. Stop asking. He's not joking. Anyone. Anyone here who is listening. That's that's enough out of you. You're never going to escape. You're going to be here forever. Are you ready for part two? Uh. Anyways, guys, please like uh, and share this with people. Uh, Let me know what I can do better. Let me know how we can improve the show. I really hope the audio quality is helping you guys listen to it a little easier. Uh, I know when I was just kind of listening listening to it earlier for some editing purposes for the opening part, I definitely, it it, it helped me. (laughs) I liked it more. So uh, thanks again, Brayden, for coming out this week. So uh, again, if you want to shout out your real socials, you know, follow him because he's going to start doing stuff on Twitch and he's going to start his own show. Yeah, so I have managed to almost 100% avoid uh, having any type of social media presence, so all socials will be given at a later date. Okay. Because these chains are tight and there is no escape. (laughs) This is my hellish punishment. But I had a really good time, and thank you for having me on, and I'm looking forward to next week. Awesome. All right, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.